Hi there, I'm Ricky Jeffrey. The title of my presentation is EAP in a Scientific Revolution, English for Open and Reproducible Science. Here's the abstract. Pause if you want to look in more detail. I've highlighted the key points in bold and the three key practical applications I'll talk about in, in this talk in red. A couple of graphs showing how people are talking more about open science in scientific research. People are doing uh, open science more and more in their research. Uh, and even governments, policymakers are paying more and more attention to, to these scientific reforms. What is open science? Well, it's a range of re reforms with the goals of improving the transparency of scientific research. So that means making more scientific information available to more people, typically by getting our data sets, our methods, our materials, and making it all available uh, on an online rep repository. Uh, the reproducibility of scientific research. So for example, somebody conducts a large study, a trial into a vaccine for COVID, and they find that it's 90% effective in, in that study. And then we hope that that study was done with, with a sufficient quality that when we take that same vaccine and give it to people in our country, that it will have also around 90% effectiveness, that the findings are reproducible and also efficiency. So this isn't about the outputs or the quality of the outputs, but the inputs that we can use, we, we can put in less time and less effort uh, and still have the, the same achievements. Uh, now, on the right is a large table of specific practices to help achieve these goals, and these practices are becoming more and more popular uh, in things like PhD training uh, and that kind of thing. Most of these are methodological, uh, the training people to collect their data, analyze their data with higher quality. The ones I've outlined here in red are practices with closer application to communication, and you can kind of, uh, it's more obvious the link to how this should change EAP practice. I'll start by talking about one of these, a use of reporting checklists, and then I'll, I'll talk about two others, which aren't represented here, but I, I also think that they will help us uh, better achieve those three open science goals. So first thinking about discourse and specifically Discourse for when students are dealing with data in some sense, they're doing some kind of uh, empirical data collection. Of course, this typically happens at postgraduate level when they're doing a master's dissertation or a PhD thesis, but also it, it can happen uh, quite broadly in um, at undergraduate level as well. Uh, and normally when we are teaching students the discourse structure for a piece of writing where there's data collection involved, the classic structure IMRD, Introduction Method Results Discussion. If you look at the textbook by Swales and Feek uh, and um, popular genre studies and studies of academic corpora, it's very common to divide it into those major four or five sections. And then there might be some guidance on the kind of thing that is written in the introduction, the kind of thing that is written in the method section. Maybe there'll be five bullet points and some of them will be kind of fuzzy and they'll say, well, you might need this or you might not. Now, th this uh, set of reporting standards on, on this slide here, it, it does the same thing. It has a suggested discourse structure, but it's just much, much, much more detailed. Uh, than the, the ones that we're, that we're used to in, e, in EAP curricula, or at least that, that I've come across in my experience. So this set of reporting standards, this one is produced by the APA, the American Psychological Association. They produce it primarily for students and researchers in psychology. But if you look at it, if you go into the website, you can see that it applies quite broadly uh, across the social sciences. Uh, we just looked at the guidance for writing the abstract, the introduction, the start of the method section. This slide here shows uh, the, the next bit of the method section, and then we would need uh, another slide to finish off the method section. So there's really a lot of detail here. Normally, uh, in maybe EAP curricula, they would suggest a few things, half a dozen things that you might do in, in a method section. Here we have something like 30 separate uh, subsections. Uh, and well, why do this? 
Well, there are two advantages to it. The uh, first is that when you've got this level of comprehensive detail, uh, and if you're encouraging everyone in your field to uh, do their writing, their, their writing about empirical studies at this level of detail, then nobody's missing anything. So, for example, on the right here, we have this subsection participant selection. If you look at the second bullet point, provide the general context for the study when data were collected, the sites of data collection. So when data were collected, this is the kind of thing that might be missed in a lot of social science studies. Somebody may write about who the participants were, how they, find the, how they found the participants, how they selected the participants. They may, they may not just say, well, we, they, they completed the questionnaire between January and February 2020. Now, uh, highlighting that they completed the questionnaire uh, between January and February 2020, rather than between April and May 2020, that makes quite a difference. Let's say the participants are all in the US. Well, th the first period was before the pandemic. The second period was in the first uh, wave of the pandemic. So that uh, affects the date. That's important information that we should know. Similarly, it could be in political science. It could be in social psychology, sociology, education. Uh, was it was the data collected during a recession? Was it collected before some education reforms or after education reforms, uh, before or after some uh, major presidential election? So uh, having this level of data just improves transparency. Uh, and then the, the second advantage to this is, well, the advantage of standardization. Uh, this particular sequence of sections and subsections, this particular terminology, this particular division to say that we're going to have one subsection for researcher description, one subs subsection for researcher participant relationship, that they're not going to be merged together. Now, these decisions are can be seen as relatively arbitrary, but if the consensus among everyone in the field is to uh, use this sequence, this terminology and this division of um, your discourse, it just makes everything easier. It, it means that <clears throat> when you're writing, you don't need to think, well, shall I do that section first or that section? Shall I give it this title or that title? You can say, well, I'll just follow the APA standards. When you're reading, you know what to expect, where you pick up so, uh, a study and you know where to look for this detail or, or that detail. So it makes both writing and reading more efficient. Crucially, these are prescriptive, not descriptive. It is not the case that if we looked at uh, all of the research in this area in the past 10 years, 20, 30 years, uh, that we would find a large proportion of studies have actually followed this kind of structure. No, this is not the norm. Uh, if you look in a corpus, this is not what is frequently done, not yet anyway, but it's prescribed by the APA, by disciplinary experts, for the, the two reasons that I mentioned. Now moving on to vocabulary, uh, and th this hasn't really, as, as to, to my knowledge, been talked about so much in relation to open science, but if we wanted to take those open science goals and principles of wanting to improve transparency, reproducibility and efficiency, this is another way to, to do it, I think. <clears throat> in um, my experience in EAP, when working with vocabulary, we'll do things like talking about generic vocabulary, academic word lists and updated versions and related academic word lists. We'll talk about discipline specific vocabulary with the ESAP texts uh, and so on. And there's the, the general impetus is, well, okay, you need this vocabulary and this vocabulary and this vocabulary, and it's kind of more and more and more. The major gate, gatekeeper exam to EAP globally is probably IELTS, and IELTS explicitly prizes and explicitly re rewards lexical diversity. Uh, my argument would be there's that too much lexical diversity, too, too much variety, is actually hinders uh, scientific practice. So we would decide how to use vocabulary according to lists of controlled vocabulary from different disciplines. 
an example here, again, from a social science, this is from education. This is the Education Resource Information Center, Eric uh, Thesaurus, the, the web page, the link is shown here. It's a list of several thousand terms, uh, and for each term, there's a definition given, related terms. Often it will have uh, related terms which, which it encourages you not to use. So uh, on the, the left column, there's a term discovery learning. If you click into discovery learning, it gives you a definition and it says, well, some people use the term exploration learning or exploratory learning. And Eric Thesaurus discourages people from using that. Now, uh, of course, the, there's nothing special about this vocabulary here. The, it's really quite arbitrary. So like with the second advantage of the, the discourse reporting standards, the whole point is that we say, well, this is the set of vocabulary and we suggest that everyone in our field use this. That makes writing easier, where when the student is writing, they don't have to uh, get to grips with 10 different pieces of vocabulary for the same concept or a very uh, similar overlapping concepts. They just use the, this resource here. They know that it's authoritative. Uh, and then also in reading, it's easier for reading. You, you will see the same concepts coming up. Things like literature search, when you're doing a search in an academic search engine like Scopus, Google Scholar, then if more people in your field are using a controlled vocabulary, then it's much easier, much, much more efficient to uh, do that search. You don't need to put in you know, 10 different search terms. The kind of writing that we are trying to uh, discourage our, our learners from, from producing then is exemplified by this gray quote in, in, in the top right. This is from a recently published uh, educational journal article, uh, but it could equally occur in a, in a student's writing. The, the first sentence here talks about a growing number of scholars who attend to the felt and re relational, what I call affective situation of learning. Later on in the penultimate line, it says, extend how it is teachers and researchers engage intrasubjective pedagogical process of, uh, of education. So we have about four adjectives there, the felt, relational, uh, what I call affective and the intrasubjective. So th there's a proliferation of vocabulary. Now, the, the truth is it's, it's more difficult for students to produce this in the first place. And then once produced, it's more difficult for people to read, to search through and so on. It, it, it's and whatever meaning is intended to be communicated here, it's going to be communicated less efficiently with, with this kind of, of writing. What's the overlap here with social emotional learning? Uh, is it the same or is it related? Uh, how about the other related terms in Eric Thesaurus, like emotional development, emotional intelligence, interper interpersonal uh, competence, other uh, terms in psychology from uh, a controlled vocabulary in psychology, like the APA Dictionary of Psychology, now, instead of using any of those controlled vocabulary terms, the, this writer is using a, a range of vocabulary, trying to get a, a, the a, what this concept is, and throws in a load of citations as well. We have about seven different citations that are related to, to this concept. So to really understand this concept, we need to go and read these seven citations. To these seven studies, do they all agree with each other? Presumably they, they don't. So just trying to communicate this concept is... Uh, really quite inefficient. So we, we've talked about discourse and vocabulary, uh, and those two things, of course, fall quite typically within the domain of, of applied linguistics. But quite a, apart from uh, teaching our students to use language in a particular way, because it, it better promotes and achieves transparency, reproducibility, and efficiency, I think also a greater use of non-linguistic content not, so the content that is not language or not entirely linguistic, for example, tables and figures. In the, the bottom left, we, it's a table, we can see language in there, but the physical arrangement into this, this table structure, that's not really uh, linguistic. The figures on the bottom right with, with the arrows and then the figures uh, are at the, the top and the top right with colors and, and a map and so on. Now, why do this? Well, why should our students use uh, language more? Well, th this is different to what I said about discourse and vocabulary. About discourse and vocabulary, it's the idea that so far in the disciplines, in, in 
essay writing for science and social science students and dissertations and research articles, people aren't always using that controlled vocabulary and people aren't always using that detailed discourse structure. But if they did, it would help the discipline better achieve its goals. Uh, so arguing for more prescription with non-linguistic content like, like this, tables and figures, well, actually, this is already quite common. So if we really were um, uh, very, very faithful to what the disciplines are doing, then I would argue we should already be doing this more in EAP curricula. Perhaps one reason why we don't do it is that when people are doing the, the studies of academic corpora, uh, they are mostly analysing the language. The, the tables and the figures just get missed. I'm sure there are some wonderful studies that do that, that they do uh, a corpus study of a load of tables or the, the integration of tables in uh, an essay or in essays or, or articles. But in my experience, it's just kind of missed. Now, why are these so common in, in scientific writing? Well, because it's just so much more concise, isn't it? For, for one reason, the, uh, in the bottom right, the figure with the, the arrows, it is just telling us the causal relations between the, these uh, different constructs. The residence influences pesticide exposure, which in turn emphasizes lymphoma, lymphoma and so on. We could express that in uh, set words, sentences and paragraphs, but it would take more time for us to write it. It would take more time for our readers to, to, re to read it and absorb it. And then even after they've absorbed it, they probably won't absorb it as effectively uh, as they do when they're presented with uh, a figure, a DAG, directed acyclic graph uh, like this. Similarly, for the two figures at the top uh, with colors, uh, and then with, with a map, the, the location of these sites are, are on this map. Again, that could all be described in, in words, but it just won't be communicated as concisely and probably not as effectively either. Similarly, with the table on the bottom left, it's mostly language. Uh, and we could communicate all of this uh, similarly in paragraphs and saying, well, this dimension, here are some example quotes of it. But immediately, just by looking at it, we can see the... The, the conceptual hierarchy, we can see that struggle and success is uh, one, one dimension. It includes within it two sub-dimensions. And then on, on the same level, the same conceptual level of struggle and success is emancipation, which in turn includes uh, two sub-dimensions. We're showing that immediately just by the, the position on the page. And for what it's worth, I've now taught uh, several different institutions, master's students, PhD students, some undergraduate teaching as well, uh, incorporating these open science practices uh, into the courses, and I feel with some success. There's the summary, and there's how to get in touch with me if you'd like to.